General, good morning and, and thanks very much for making the, the time for us. And you'd be aware that it's the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Royal Australian Air Force. And uh, that actually came after the First World War when the uh, Air Force operated uh, extensively uh, in Europe and elsewhere as the Australian Flying Corps. Um, so it's, it's the timing of this interview is great. But um, now you have indicated that you are uh, keen for the United States Air Force to buy the Wedgetail uh, airborne warning and control aircraft. The Wedgetail was developed uh, by the United States in large part for the Royal Australian Air Force. And I gather it proved highly successful in operations over Iraq and Syria. How are the Australian aircraft on those missions regarded by US commanders and personnel? And has that had a bearing on your choice? Uh, it has, yeah, thanks for that question. And so. You know, the back, background might be helpful, and, and I know you're very aware of this, but, you know, the, the responsibility that I have for the Pacific Air Forces is, is, you know, a vast region, you know, about half the world's surface. A lot of that's, you know, covered by water, and so there's not ground-based radars. And, you know, we certainly can get some situational awareness uh, from space, um, but, you know, the, the fact is, is that we need to have an airborne moving target indicator. You know, some kind of um, aircraft that has a radar on it or a sensor on it that can detect um, flying objects um, and then uh, network that information uh, back to um, the Air Operations Center and shooters, uh, for that matter. And so we, we currently have the E3 AWACS, but um, as you know, that it's a, a very old aircraft. And what we're experiencing uh, lately with that aircraft is a... Um, you know, just a, a lack of reliability because of how old it is. And so it's not the radar that's breaking um, specifically. Um, it's engines, hydraulics, electrics, those kind of things that just keep it from getting airborne. And so if it can't get airborne, it can't do its job. So we need we need to modernize uh, just to have something reliable. But, you know, with, with respect to the E7, and I'm, I'm on record as um, supporting that because uh, I got asked the question, which one, you know, you know, which which one of the AMTIs, uh, do you support? And I, I said E7. Uh, so I've had a chance to fly on uh, the Australian Wedgetail. And what was really cool about it is I got to fly on that um, within a day of flying on a um, E3, both uh, executing the same mission, which happened to be a red flag Alaska mission. Um, and the two missions were vastly different uh, because everything was so smooth on the E7 and um, it, it was not so smooth on the E3. Many maintenance issues, uh, comm was a problem that day. The radar was having some troubles and you know, everything was smooth sailing on the, the E7. And so from that day, and that was several years ago, um, I've been a huge fan uh, of the E7 um, from the standpoint of reliability, um, but it's got a lot of capabilities that the E3 does not have, which will improve um, our capability. And then the last part, is the interoperability. You mentioned it, you all have it and have been um, really um, the foundational operator of, of that platform. As you know, other countries uh, like um, the Republic of Korea, uh, the UK is gonna be getting some soon and there are others um, that, that are operating that platform. And the interoperability of facet um, is really important to me um, as we uh, think about the strategy in the Indo-Pacific region uh, we we all want and desire that interoperability because um, that that that'll put pressure on our adversaries here. General, did you have any understanding or knowledge of the RAF's operations in in uh, in the Middle East with the with the E seven? I did. Uh, so uh, during the time that uh, you had the E seven out there, I was actually the director of operations for U.S. Uh, Central Command. And so um, the the first thing is, you know, thank you because that was uh, during a time when um, you know the fight with ISIS was um, uh, pretty significant. Um, and so um, having allies and partners um, in the region there and contributing uh, to the air picture, among other things. I mean, you had other things uh, there in the Middle East besides the E seven. Um, but that that was um, greatly, greatly appreciated. And they did they did a fantastic job and they inter um, they, they were very much interoperable with the uh, with the other command and control assets that we had airborne there. 
um, as well as the, the ISR platforms, because the E7 uh, can link in, uh, you know, not only from command and control, but also uh, can link in with the ISR platform. So uh, really, really outstanding, um, outstanding capability that we certainly appreciated um, the, the RAF being there um, in the Middle East and contributing to the overall effort. Well, now we have just seen uh, Boeing's, Boeing Australia's loyal wingman uncrewed aircraft take its first flight at the Woomera testing range. Um, and that was after only three years of development. Does the US Air Force have a, an interest in that project? And might there be room for joint development? And what role do you see for manned, unmanned teaming? Uh, I'm glad you asked this question because um, I just was visiting um, Boeing in St. Louis um, and I specifically asked them uh, for a briefing um, on the Loyal Wingman program, which, which I received. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested in it. Um, and, and certainly the U.S. Air Force is um, interested in man-on-man -man teaming uh, and, and unmanned um, uh, straightaway. Uh, there, there are a number of uh, reasons why why we're interested in this, but you know, the the one that uh, it is you know probably the the most um, acute in my mind is when you think about going into an anti area access denial area, so a highly defended uh, piece of airspace to create effects with your air power. Um, you're taking incredible risk uh, when uh, you send in you know, uh, an aircraft with a highly trained operator, a fighter pilot, uh, and they might not come back, right? If it's a really well defended um, airspace. And so uh, they, with the advent of this manned unmanned teaming, you know, perhaps if you had an unmanned wingman, you can send your unmanned in there uh, to create um, similar effects uh, and, not have to worry about the fact that if that if that unmanned wingman gets shot down, um, you know you you lose a buddy too. Uh, so um, that that's one one part of this that's uh, that's really uh, uh, you know very very much attractive, um, and we certainly are uh, looking at that um, as we go forward um, by modernizing our force. Uh, we certainly are looking at. Um, options uh, to be able to do this. We're not in a spot right yet to do the, you know, the teaming per se um, that you spoke of uh, from the standpoint of a, a joint venture, um, but but we're certainly uh, watching it very closely and, and evaluating, you know, how we want to um, implement this as we go into the future. Um, I know that you're 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 well aware of the number of um, unmanned platforms that we we have already that we're, we're operating. Um, and they're they're um, they've been very successful for us, um, and we found uh, you know more better ways to to use those um, every year that we go forward, and so um, this manned unmanned teaming would be a, a natural evolution um, to operating in the tactical environment. It may be entirely different for a United States commander like yourself, but. We were quite surprised that they were able to do it so fast from sort of decision to, um, decision to first flight taking three years. It seemed quite remarkable to us. Um, I'm so impressed and I'm, I'm really thankful for um, the leadership uh, that the RAF has shown in, in this area. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm impressed also, uh, and it is remarkable to see the speed at which uh, this has happened. And um, the you know I, we're you know we're in follow mode right now, and we're we're quite happy about that because um, the the Australian uh, the Royal Australian Air Force has been a leader uh, a, a number of times throughout history. Uh, you know, one of them also is you know really one of the first fifth generation um, air forces, uh, which uh, you know was was a, was a goal of yours, and um, you know your you're you're about ready to do achieve that and um, that's 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 another area of, of leadership um, that's um, very impressive and you know i wish we could achieve that but we we're not anywhere close to that we're still flying b-52s and kc-135s uh, so um, our our fleet is uh, a lot older than yours and uh, that's something that we're trying to work on but no i i'm impressed by the leadership 
um, and how quickly um, the RAF has put that together. And are, are you getting comprehensive feedback from Australia on the Loyal Wingman project? Well, it's still pretty early. You know, I think, I, I don't know how many flights uh, they've done so far. The last, last time I, I spoke uh, uh, to uh, a senior member of the RAF was um, a few weeks ago. And it had all, at that time, it, uh, the Loyal Wingman uh, jet had only flown one sortie and it was really positive feedback. I mean, that sortie went went really, really well. Um, but and I'm sure they've probably flown um, more times since then. I just I haven't haven't heard or gotten any feedback, but, um, you know, so far, so good. I think this is one of those projects where the uh, there's probably initial nervousness, then it takes off and comes back and everyone's very, very excited. They're probably settling down and working out what to do next. But, um, you know, clearly there's a lot of development work to happen. You bet. You bet. There's so much you can do with it, too, uh, from the standpoint of, you know, you can have it be a loyal wingman and create effects. Um, it can be a sensor. Um, so you can use it more like an ISR uh, platform. Uh, you can have it be a jammer. Um, you can even use it during training as, a, as an adversary. Uh, so it can set up and be a, a practice adversary for you. So... There's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. There's quite a bit of flexibility. I'm excited about the um, the future. You made some interesting comments about the, the RAF and, uh, and being a fifth generation aircraft, air, uh, air force, and um, you know, defence writers and people who follow it closely will be well aware of that. But a lot of Australians probably aren't aware of just how sophisticated the aircraft is. The, the air force has become over a relatively short time. Now, how do you rate Australia's air force? Uh, yeah, they're they're um, absolutely top notch. Absolutely top notch. I've had a chance to fly and operate uh, with the RAF uh, throughout my career. I, I started as a young captain. Uh, one of one of my uh, really, you know, one of my first trips in the Pacific was to RAF Base Williamtown uh, to fly with the Hornets there. Uh, back when I was a young captain, and had two chances during uh, during my tour in Japan to to. Um, to deploy down to Williamtown to do that. And um, uh, back then, even, you know, really that was in the early nineties, uh, the professionalism, you know, that, that we um, got to see uh, when, when we were there um, was evident. Uh, and um, every single member of the squadron that we flew with was highly competent, extremely professionalism. And, you know, I, I had a sense back then uh, even then, that um, that the, the Australian Air Force was full up, and uh, you know there there's none better. There really is none better from the professionalism standpoint, and uh, especially now, you know, fast forward, you know, almost really 30 years um, now, you know, you're leading the world in many aspects of um, putting together air power um, in a way that can create effects across a a wide spectrum of, um, you know, capabilities uh, that that's impressive. And, you know, we're, we're watching uh, and following, frankly, uh, from the United States Air Force standpoint in many ways. Right. Well, now the Pacific Air Force celebrating its 75th birthday and the, the RAF is uh, celebrating its 100th. And, and what do you see as the enduring ties that bind the two Air Forces? Yeah, so the, the 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 enduring ties that bind the Air Force are the enduring ties that bind the two nations, and many other nations uh, for that matter. And, and that is, you know, like-mindedness uh, from the standpoint of our national objectives of you know freedom and democracy and the rule of law. Um, uh, certainly, for the Indo-Pacific region, um, Australia and the United States uh, share the objective of a free and open Indo-Pacific um, and a rules-based order. I and mean, I think that's what binds um, the, the Air Forces uh, as well. Um, but then when you, when you bring it um, back down uh, to the military, um, it, there, there's also a, a shared uh, vision of you know, the appropriate use of force uh, and, and not you know, when it's not appropriate. Um, those those uh, you know, those values are shared by the two, two nations. 
um, as as well as you know how how to go about that. And so we're certainly interoperable in so many aspects of um, putting together air power packages. And you know if you if you had uh, RAF um, F 35s or uh, you know um, growlers. F-15s, F-16s, F-22s, uh, they would have no problem operating together even today. Uh, and so from that standpoint, the, the interoperability and, and the ability to achieve objectives together, um, and we practice often, uh, and lately because of COVID, not as often as we'd like, but still we, we've been um, operating. Uh, we still have, uh, have the capability to um, execute you know, even on short notice. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that is uh, one of the, the main strengths that we have between the, the USAF and the RAF. And would you like to see any particular areas of interoperability grow? You know, we're doing pretty well with that. And uh, we, I, I, I have um, a frequent chance to talk as well as my staff um, has a chance to talk with the, um, the RAF um, headquarters as well. Um, to discuss ways where we can improve. And, um, and so the dialogue's really strong. Uh, we have a number of exercises. In fact, we just did uh, Cope North uh, recently out of Guam, uh, where uh, some of the members of the RAF were there along with Japan and the United States. And so that, that just was a few weeks ago. Great exercise, a lot of good learning, uh, a lot of opportunities to uh, share uh, lessons learned and best practices. and. And we did that all in a COVID environment safely, I might add. Uh, so, you know, everybody uh, got into um, Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. Everybody was tested. We, we kept a working uh, uh, restriction of movement for the exercise participants. And you know, except for one observer uh, from, uh, you know, one other country, uh, we, we had no COVID cases at all. Uh, and so that, that was really good from the standpoint that we got a chance to operate together, but also that we could do it safely uh, without uh, spreading the disease. So um, all, all that was re really, really positive. So, you know, as we as we go forward and uh, we have more opportunities, uh, perhaps uh, later this year with Talisman Sabre and, and other exercises, uh, we'll have more chances to um, improve uh, improve upon what we can already do. But, you know, it's that continuous improvement uh, by exercising together and debriefing and learning what you can do better and then applying that um, on the next mission. That's how we continue to improve ourselves and continue to improve our interoperability. And that, that's the, the benefit and the, the value of training together um, as often as, as we can uh, so that we can continue to get better. You mentioned Talisman Sabre, and Australian pilots take part in, in that exercise, obviously, with, with Americans, but also in the American uh, red flag uh, exercise. You know, how important is that, that sort of training? Because some of it would be quite extreme, I imagine. Um, I don't know. It it's, it's difficult training, but that's the intent of it is for it to be intense and difficult um, because, you know, we feel like if your training um, is, is difficult and intense, you know, if and when you ever um, have to do it in the real world, you kind of been there, done that, right? And so uh, we intend for those, those types of trainings to stress the force and to, to present difficult problems uh, for the tacticians to solve uh, that aren't uh, just easy problems to solve, but rather difficult ones, um, because um, they'll improve their performance, uh, they'll, uh, they'll increase their capability over time, and then they'll learn, and they'll actually develop new tactics, new techniques, new procedures uh, to be able to win in a very difficult environment. And uh, let's face it, you know, potential adversaries are also doing this and they're getting better as well. And so if we're training to what they could do 20 years ago, you know, we're, we are not um, making the best use of the assets that our nations have uh, provided for us to defend them. Uh, so we absolutely need to make this difficult because um, our adversaries will 
Uh, we'll try to make it difficult if we ever get into a conflict. So, so that, that's why it's so important to, to do this um, on a high end um, as well as frequently, uh, because these are skills that are perishable oftentimes. And uh, we, we want to make sure that um, we're proficient uh, at, at these events as well. Now, Australia uh, produced uh, last year a, a strategic update. Basically, we have a system of white papers that come out every few years updating a, 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 with a blueprint for how we should examine our strategic situation and, and upgrade our forces or adapt them accordingly. Um, it was a fairly... Um, it was a serious document that talked about the possibility of conflicts um, developing much more quickly than the sort of 10 years of warning that we'd been, we'd considered we would have un until then. Um, now, how serious do you view the situation in the region and, uh, and, and how important is it to have a, a competent, comprehensive ally in the region? Yeah, so there's a number of things that are happening uh, in the region, um, Indo-Pacific in particular, that's the region we're talking about. <laughs> there are some uh, people that tuned in late, uh, but uh, there's some things that are happening in the region that have me concerned. And uh, I'll, I'll just go over a few of them. You know, what, one of them is what recently happened in Hong Kong. So, you know, previously uh, the Chinese uh, and when I say the Chinese, I'll say Chinese a few times during this. Uh, what I'm really talking about is the Chinese Communist Party, uh, not necessarily the, the Chinese people themselves, but the Chinese Communist Party had promised the people of Hong Kong that they could exercise democratic um, principles uh, in, inside, of, inside of Hong Kong. And of course, we saw very recently they went back on that promise and have made it illegal. That's one. Uh, we've seen um, some friction along the border with our friends in India, uh, where they took over some territory that the Indians claimed. Uh, and we feel like that's not in accordance with international law and certainly is abrasive to one of their neighbors. Uh, we've seen them in the South China Sea and the East China Sea either taking over islands that didn't belong to them um, or building new ones from atolls or, or sandbars or whatever. Um, that's certainly not in accordance uh, with um, international law. Uh, we've seen them exercising economic coercion. Uh, when they don't like something that a country has done, uh, they impose um, pretty aggressive economic measures to, to place cost on that country. An example, when the Republic of Korea agreed to allow United States to put um, the THAAD into the peninsula, a totally defensive weapon, uh, which uh, China really shouldn't have had um, had problems with. Um, they they cost uh, the Republic of Korea uh, millions, maybe even billions of dollars um, because they weren't happy with, with them. Um, and then, you know, the the predatory lending pro processes that we've seen around the, the uh, region where they lend you know, a bunch of money uh, to uh, nations that need help with one thing or another, uh, knowing that they can't pay them back uh, and then use that as leverage to get something that they want. Um, and I call that buyer's remorse. Um, and so all of these things uh, lead me uh, to be concerned about, you know, a lack of a rule of law and a respect uh, for other nations um, by complying with international law and norms. Um, and so that has me worried. And so to, to get at the gist of your question though, how important is it to, to have allies? That's the one thing that we've got going for us. Um, because if you look at the number of uh, countries that will line up and say, yeah, I'm, I'm with China, it's a pretty short list. But if you look at the, the number of countries that are like-minded like the United States um, and Australia, there's a lot you know, on our team uh, and uh, we can take advantage because um, the China, when the China looks at the United States or if they look at Australia, they're not just looking at Australia or the United States. They're looking at our entire team. 
Um, and they've got to put that into their calculus um, if they want to take it to the next level and create a conflict or a crisis. Um, they, they have to calculate through what, what that's going to mean for them um, if we're relatively unified. And um, I think that's the strength um, of having allies and partners that are like-minded and um, are working toward objectives together. Thank you. Look, um, towards the end of last year, the, the Royal Australian Air Force launched its new Air Force strategy, and that noted major changes in both technology and the global strategic environment. Um, the Air Force takes a position that traditional tactical and operational excellence is no longer enough to be sure of fighting and winning. And there needs to be greater thought and investment um, on how to provide a broad range of options to government, to our governments, to meet contemporary challenges, particularly in operations below the threshold of conflict in the grey zone. Do you share this view? And is the United States Air Force also positioning itself for this? Uh, we do share the view. We, we have different terminology, but it means the same thing. Uh, we're, we're calling it competition and we're competing every single day um, in our operations, uh, not just um, in the Air Force, um, but it's true of the Navy and the Marines and the Army and the Space Force are conducting operations to compete uh, with um, our adversaries around the globe. So in our in our um, in my area of responsibility, you know, that means uh, China, it means Russia, it means uh, North Korea and other parts of the globe. It means um, Iran. You know, those are the, the main the main competitors uh, for us at the moment. Uh, and uh, to to the point that uh, you made of um, options, um, I don't believe, and uh, I know some others share this view, that this is a mill only, a military only um, activity. Um, and so, you know, in the United States, we're counting on other parts of our government uh, to help us out with this competition. So our U.S. State Department, uh, Treasury, Commerce, I mean, there's, there's a lot of other people, a whole of government of, um, effort um, is much more effective than if we're just trying to do this in the in the military um, part of this. Um, but um, you know, diplomatic information, military, and economic, all of those uh, things um, will be important in in a competition uh, to perhaps avoid a crisis or perhaps avoid a conflict. Um, if you're successful in this in this competition arena, we call it competition. You call it gray zone. It's I think it's very very similar. Yes, and look, there's been all sorts of expressions around for roughly the same idea, like hybrid warfare, and uh, I'm sure the Russian General Gerasimov could give us a, a decent explanation of a few a few skills that the, the Russians have developed over the years. Look, I had a conversation, a fascinating conversation, with the Chief of our Air Force, uh, Air Marshal Mel Hupfield, um, a, a day or two ago, and one of the points that he made is the, um, the technology is developing so fast that... There's got to be very careful examination of what's available and what's out there as we make new choices for, for, a, for a traditional aircraft or other platforms. And he also makes the point that, that some of the capabilities might not even be aircraft, that they, they might be space-based or space, techno, space sensors linked to land or ocean-based uh, systems. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I agree with Mel, and uh, we, you know, we're, we're um, really exploring a um, concept and, and advancing a concept called joint all domain command and control. And the idea behind joint all domain command and control, we call it JADC2. You may you may have heard of this uh, concept, but the the, uh, the point of JADC2 is to create dilemmas for your adversary. Um, at a volume and a pace uh, that makes a coherent response impossible. And what, what I'm talking about is, is that, you know, the joint part of this is Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Space Force. And what, what I actually want to do is expand it so it'll be combined joint all domain command and control uh, so that we bring in allies and partners into this um, as well. Um, but, but the idea that um, you can create um, synchronized 
um, and integrated fires and by fires they could be kinetic or non-kinetic so they could uh, happen from space uh, they could happen from cyber they could be subsurface by a submarine they certainly could be from an aircraft um, and so on and so forth um, but if if you have the ability to know what's happening in the environment i.e you have domain awareness in all of those domains um, and then you have the ability uh, to uh, tell your forces in those domains uh, to create effects um, that would be synchronized with the other effects that are happening concurrently. Um, the response to that's very difficult um, because uh, you'll be you'll be creating those effects so fast uh, that your adversary will not be able to um, respond in a way that will be effective for them. Um, so we're we're talking quite a bit about. Uh, having non-kinetic effects that support kinetic and vice versa. Uh, and so that technology it takes to do all of that is, you know, really on the cusp and it's developing um, as we speak. So um, there's, there's a lot, lot to do there, but, you know, to, to another point is we've got to be really careful because the technology that we're acquiring today is incredibly expensive. Uh, and you don't want to buy uh, something that's going to be obsolete in, you know, a few years or even next year. Uh, so we have to be very uh, wise and cautious um, as we go forward to pick the technologies um, that will um, be worth their weight uh, in, in however much we spend on them because they are very expensive and we, we don't want to waste the precious resources of our countries. Well, just before I let you go, um, there's, there's considerable excitement in Canberra um, we're, um, over the, the birthday of the, the Air Force. They've obviously put a lot of work into uh, marking the occasion. There's going to be a significant fly past over the, the central um, city of Canberra in the um, next Wednesday. Um, would you have any particular message for the Royal Australian Air Force and for people like Mel Hupfield? Well, um, the, the first thing is happy anniversary. Um, we're so excited uh, to, to celebrate with you. Uh, and the, the only regret that we have is that we can't be there in person. Uh, but as a matter of fact, um, right after this, I'm filming a video, uh, which will be my, uh, my expression of uh, congratulations uh, to the men and women of the Royal Australian Air Force. And, and uh, the, other, the other message uh, that we'll have is uh, thank you for the incredible friendship uh, because it's not lost on me uh, that every time I have been in harm's way, I've been either shoulder to shoulder or in very close proximity to an Aussie. Uh, and uh, that what that says to me um, is that we share, uh, we share the values uh, and, and, uh, and we're willing uh, to commit, you know, our nation's treasures, which, which really are our young people, um, to, uh, to further peace and stability and freedom uh, around the world. Um, and so that, that means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to um, the Australian people. And so we're, we're thrilled uh, for the RAF uh, celebrating their 100th, 100th anniversary, and we'll definitely be celebrating uh, with you uh, next week. And, um, and I hope to, to be able to travel if COVID will allow uh, to Avalon this year. Um, if, if we're going to have, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have that. And I know we'll carry on the celebration um, even, into, um, even into September, or actually it's November, I think it is November. So it'll be fun. It was back. Thanks very much for your time. And uh, it's been fascinating chatting. Oh, it's been fascinating chatting with you, Brendan. So thank you so much for your questions. Uh, they were great questions. I really enjoyed uh, my time with you. And, and, and uh, like we said earlier, if you have any uh, follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to uh, re-engage with us. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Take care. All right, All right you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,